So, well, first, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, so for those who are not familiar with your work, tell everyone who you are, where they can find you, and how you got into gardening. Okay, well, uh, my name is C.L. Fenari. I use my initials. I have my radio audience convinced that they stand for compost lovers, so <laughs> we will just leave it at that. Um, I am, I call myself a garden communicator. I write about plants and gardens. I speak about plants and gardens. I have a podcast that I co-host called Plant Rama about plants and gardens, and I host a weekly radio show. So, and all of that because um, I, I want to share my joy about plants and gardens with other people, help them to find their joy in those same, same things. So uh, that's basically it. How I got started, I never intended to be a garden writer. I never intended to be a public speaker. I, all my young life, all I wanted to do was make stuff. I wanted to go into my art studio and make stuff. And um, I was an art major in college. I was then became a production hand weaver and worked with fiber and later transitioned to working with paper. But a lot of that work, frankly, had plants and gardens as its theme. I've always been interested in plants and I, I credit that to the fact that I was fortunate enough to go up and grow up in a time when kids were pushed outside and told not to come back until mealtime. <laughs> and we had to make our fun in the natural world, you know, and, and certainly my family and most of the kids that I grew up with, nobody had much money for anything. And so the natural world was our playground, you know, climbing trees and making forts and hanging out under the shrubs and poking yeah. around, you know, um, in the weeds. Uh, that was our entertainment. And that, I think, is what got me hooked on plants. And in fact, my, my first quote unquote professional uh, job having to do with plants was when I was in the second grade. And my friend and I decided that we needed money to buy candy. And how do you get money? You sell something. And so we found a stack of old flower pots behind the house that my parents were renting at the time. And we took those pots and we filled them with dirt. And then we scampered around the neighborhood cutting flowers off of neighbors' plants. <laughs> in other words, stealing their flowers, <laughs> which we then stuck into dirt in these flower pots and then sold them as potted plants door to door. Um, I, I can only imagine that we must have been cute because we were selling them to the very same people we had stolen them from in the first place. <laughs> How entrepreneurial. And, yeah, that's right. Well, since then I've learned a lot more about the importance of root systems um, and ethics. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But that's that was kind of the germ of my interest in plants is, you know, my, as a as a as a kid playing out in the natural world. Uh, it's a very interesting story on how you started gardening. <laughs> <laughs> um, so gardening in the maritime climate of Cape Cod must be difficult. What unique challenges do you face each season? Do you have a greenhouse? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't say it's difficult. I would say that every region has its challenges, you know, um, if you live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, it's dry, right? Um, if you live in Cape Cod, it's moist and wet in the spring and cold in the spring. But on the other hand, it's warm all fall. So there are, there are conditions in every part of the country that a garden lover learns to dance with. And, and I would encourage people to view it as a dance, not as a battle. Uh, because if you go into battle with nature, you're going to lose. <laughs> yeah. You're going to lose, right? Because nature, nature has the controlling interest right. here. And, um, but if you view it as a dance, then you figure out the dance steps that are necessary um, to grow things well. 
And where I am, what's necessary to grow things well is to not plant too early because our nighttime temperatures go down in the 30s or low 40s until the end of May. Uh, so we learn to not jump the gun on certain types of planting. We learn what plants thrive and which ones don't. So in my case, I've learned to grow blueberries for my fruit, not apple trees, because in our humid climate, we have more diseases, uh, you know, on the apples. And so the dance with growing an apple tree is more complicated. You know, the steps are more complicated than the dance with growing blueberries. So, yeah. you know, I, my time is important and I'm going to blow grow blueberries as a result. Very cool. So, yeah. So gardening can take place in many forms. Some people prefer to do flower gardens. Others prefer edibles, orchards, microgreens, hydroponics. The list goes on. What's your favorite kind of gardening and what are you growing right now? I would have to say my favorite is whatever I did 10 minutes ago. Uh, you know, it's, it's like asking who's your favorite child or, um, <laughs> right. you know, <laughs> there's, there's, there's not a good response there. <laughs> so um, I, I love, one of the things I love is growing edibles. I love growing vegetables. I love being able for a good six months of the year to walk into my front yard and say, what's for dinner? And um, so from about the end of May on, uh, end of May through December, there's always an answer from the garden. When I say what's for dinner, there's always an answer. So I, I love that. I love flowers. I, I grow a lot of annuals. I grow a lot of perennials, uh, flowering shrubs. Uh, here on Cape Cod, we are hysterical for hydrangeas or we have great hydrangea happiness, great hydrangea hysteria when they don't bloom well. So um, I grow a lot of those certainly. And what I have learned uh, is that when you grow a, a diverse selection of plants, plants that flower at different times, plants that uh, grow different ways, uh, a good portion of native plants, flowers and vegetables, you know, uh, if you have diversity in your yard and garden, there's A, always something magical going on, and B, you're gonna be successful in some way. You're gonna have failures, sure, but you're always going to be successful in, you know, one area or the other. And some years you're successful with one thing and not the other. And then the next year you might be successful with what failed the previous year. So, and that is, that's kind of how the natural world works too. If we, if we look at it, um, we realize that, you know, one year there, the certain plant is spectacular all everywhere we go and it catches our eye everywhere we go that particular year. And then the next year, not so much. One year, there seem to be chipmunks everywhere you look. You know, you can practically kick them out of the way when you walk through the yard. And then the next year, not as many. Uh, and so nature often works that way that there are bumper crops of whatever, you know, whether it's insects, animals, flowers, fruit. And then the next year, something doesn't do as well. And nature has reasons for it being that way. And if we pay attention to it, our experience with plants and gardens is going to be better because then we can learn, oh, this year that, I, the broccoli was a complete failure this year, right? Or I hardly got any eggplants. And knowing that the next year for any number of reasons, that crop may do better. Yeah. And you asked if I had a greenhouse. No, I don't have a greenhouse. I would love to have a greenhouse, but because of where I am and our, the shape of our property, the zoning involved, the orientation of the land, there was just no logical place to put a greenhouse. And we decided that it didn't make sense to spend the amount of money that it would take to have something that really didn't work that well. Right. <laughs> so, so what I do have, however, um, you know, as a 
anybody interested in plants learns to dodge and weave and come up with different ways to do things. And uh, what I do have is a shed that um, half of it faces due south. My husband built it. Um, it has clear panels on the roof and windows on the south side. It's insulated sides, top and bottom. And um, in that shed, I am able to start seeds early in the spring. Nice. It's solar heated. There's no electricity. There's no running water. Um, but it is solar heated and I am able to grow uh, any number of seedlings in there so that they're ready to put out in the garden in May. So that's how, how I have the compromise with no greenhouse. But if I ever move to another property, that's number one to that other property has to have a space for a greenhouse. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good segue for my next question. It's impossible to know everything about gardening. If you can go back in time, what is something about gardening you wish you knew when you first started? Um, when I first started, let me see. Well, okay, I'll tell you one design tip that I wish I knew as a new gardener. I had a big space, I was interested in perennials and my instinct was to buy one of these and one of these and one of these and one of those and to plant them. And if I had the money to buy three of something, um, I would plant one of those three on one side of the garden, one in the middle and one on the other side of the garden. And my garden never, my garden was pretty certainly uh, because if you put flowering plants together, it's gonna be pretty. But it never had the impact. It never had the, you know, that wow appeal. And I realized um, a few years into gardening what I was doing wrong, which was I was planting in polka dots. Uh, and so instead of planting those plants singly, I should have been planting in groups, in puddles, not polka dots. Because when you have a group of color, a group of flowers together, then it has impact. Then, you know, it, it, it has that wow factor. And so that's something that I wish that I had known early was to, when I found a plant that did well for me, buy more of it and plant it in a puddle, um, not singly. So that's, that's number one. And, and number two, I think as a new gardener, I wish I had known to look more to how nature grew plants and use that as my model um, for, you know, not, you know, for, for how I treated the garden because some of the garden advice that I got was um, maybe not necessary, and, uh, you know, something like, uh, oh, planting, uh, mulching a garden very deeply, you know, with 12 inches of mulch, you know, and, 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 and looking to nature, I would have seen that nature never dumps, you know, 12 inches of material on the surface of the soil. Yeah, it might be 12 inches of leaves when they're nice and crispy and f newly fallen, but once they uh, pack down in the spring, they end up being about an inch thick. Uh, and oh, that's how nature mulches plants. Uh, maybe I should take a hint. <laughs> You're a speaker, author, blogger, radio host, and avid gardener. How do you juggle so many commitments? <laughs> well, I, in fact, I think on one of my social platforms, I under job description, it says professional juggler. Um, I think everybody juggles, you know, it's a busy world. It is a busy world. And so right now I have a list of today in front of me. I have to launch a podcast, send an invoice to my radio station, uh, contact an agent about a book I want to write and do some, you know, work on a volunteer organization. So, you know, my lists are long, but I think it's all related. And, and that's the thing is that when you're First of all, it all has to do with the topic that I'm passionate about, which is plants and gardening. So that's important. If you're passionate about what your work is, whether it's you know technology 
or, or plants or food or whatever it is, if you're passionate about it, then it all ties together and um, it's, it's easier to piece together all of those pieces of, of the puzzle. So for me, all of those things are related. They all feed each other. And um, as a result, you know, you, you make your lists and, and you go through it and you try not to get sucked down the rabbit hole of YouTube or social media for too long um, so that you can get everything done. <laughs> You've written so many books and articles throughout your career. Do you prefer writing long form or telling short stories to your articles? Is one style of writing more challenging than the other? Interesting. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Well, they all have their challenges. Um, and, and in fact, recently uh, I've written two novels, which so far neither have been published. Uh, I'm actively trying to get an agent for the second one right now because some um, uh, first of all, the let me just say that um, the creative process, when you are a person who has the desire to create something, you know, it starts with the willingness to walk down that path without knowing where it's going to lead. Um, and so that's really what it takes is the, an idea sparks your interest and you have the willingness to go down a path and see where it goes. And sometimes it, it takes you someplace, sometimes those seeds germinate to use a garden uh, analogy, and sometimes they don't, you know, and the number of ideas that I've had that, that haven't germinated are formidable, um, but uh, the ones that have um, are also numerous. You know, I've had eight books published, so uh, that's that's wonderful. I like, I like writing short articles. They go quickly. Um, the challenge with an article is to make it succinct, compelling, and to tell a story along with the information. So that's the challenge in an article. It's also the challenge in a book, truly, is uh, you, you need to um, tell the story in a compelling way that people are both entertained and informed by it. And, and, um, and that's true of a podcast, that's true of a talk. Uh, so, and I think all of those things, if you are a communicator, whether you consider yourself an influencer or a writer or a speaker or a podcaster, you are communicating in the very, very first place to start in all of those communications is who is in my audience and what do they care about? What, what are they, and not only what do they care about, what are they feeling, right? Um, because if you start there th and, and answer that question, know who is in the audience and what they care about and what they are feeling and you aim your communications to that, you, you almost can't go wrong. I mean, yes, there will be people that say no and you don't get something published, but that's where it all starts. So I recently had the privilege of getting to listen to you speak a couple of days ago. And I know getting in front of a crowd and speaking can be difficult. In fact, stage fright is a very common fear amongst many people. When did you realize you wanted to start traveling and going to speaking engagements and conferences Comparing your first speaking event to today, how do you prepare and psych yourself up? Yeah, you know, they say that um, in surveys, more people are afraid of uh, public speaking than are afraid of dying. <laughs> and and uh, when I speak about speaking, uh, you know, I will say, so that means that there are people in this audience who would rather be dead than to be up here where I am now, right? <laughs> And, and, I, and that, you know, I, I certainly recognize that. And when I began speaking, I was certainly nervous. I did, I did some speaking in high school. I was active in drama in high school and uh, forensics I, it was what they called it back then. I don't know if they call it the same thing now, but I was active in that speaking sort of arena in high school. 
I did not do any of it um, early on. I guess I did speak when I was a hand weaver. I spoke a couple of times about a um, at weaving fiber conventions about a technique that I used. So I think you know there are some people who are who are um, I just kind of drawn toward teaching, and I think you have to be drawn toward teaching to to be um, a speaker, or you need to be so passionate about what you do that you want to get comfortable sharing it with others. And, and the way you do that is the way you get comfortable with typing on a keyboard. You practice, right? Uh, nobody is born knowing how to type quickly, uh, and, but you do it. And the more you do it, the better you get. And it's exactly the same with speaking. The more you do it, the better you get. And so um, practicing and, and when I speak about speaking skills, which, which I do, uh, I often say that, you know, you need to, to not only, you know, you need to rehearse certainly, but you need to rehearse out loud standing up and, and you do that, you need to rehearse out loud as often as possible. And I used to say to people, go over your talk in the car when you're driving. Now, in the old days, you know, 25 years ago, when you would do that, other cars would give you the hairy eyeball and pull away from you because they thought there was a crazy person there. Now, of course, everybody thinks you're on a hand-free cell. So you can be rehearsing a talk driving along, no one gives you a second look. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. So, but just doing it, the more often you do it, the easier it becomes. It truly does. And rehearsing is the name of the game. And for anyone uh, who is listening to this and is interested in a public speaking, join Toastmasters. You know, every region has a Toastmasters group. And that's what they're all about is supporting people becoming comfortable speaking in front of other people. And the more you do it, the more you realize that it's just, you know, it's like telling a story around the dinner table. And I often, you know, tell people, um, as I say, I never intended to be a speaker. And as a kid, I was like, I was the type of kid that hid behind her mother's skirts in a, in a crowd, you know? And my mom once said to me, it's so amazing what happened with you because you used to be so shy and, and you know, unable to talk to anyone. And now here you are, you know, on the radio and speaking to people. And I thought to myself, well, mom, I'm still that shy person. Uh, you know, I still feel that way. I still have a hard time going up to strangers at a conference or at parties or whatever. But what you learn is that how you feel is one thing and how you behave is another. And so you can behave as if you are not a shy person uh, and um, getting up in front of an audience, you can behave as if you are not afraid of public speaking when I, and you know what, the more you behave as if, the more you yourself buy it and, and everybody else buys it from the get go. <laughs> they have no idea that inside you're thinking, oh, I would rather crawl under a rock than to be in front of you today. <laughs> I wanna discuss your remarkable radio show, Garden Line. Speaking on the radio is a dream for many broadcast majors out there. How do you prepare for a show? And how did you make your first steps into the spotlight and start your radio debut? Yeah, well, radio is an interesting um, place and it, it's, it's a, and completely different than podcasting. And the thing about radio is, um, first of all, you need to talk somebody into giving you airtime. <laughs> and, and there are several ways that can happen in the world of radio. In the world of radio, there are some people who want a radio program and they actually buy their time from the radio station. There are some people who want a radio program and they uh, are talk radio station into paying them for their time. And um, there are some people who have that radio time and in return they have to sell the advertising. 
So anybody who's interested in um, radio, particularly commercial radio, but this somewhat applies to public radio as well. The money part of it is key and, and has to be worked out, you know, um, and there are several options for doing that. I got my start in radio because I am a member of Garden.com, which is the association of garden communicators. Uh, at that time, it was called Garden Writers. But um, in one of the Garden.com uh, publications, they mentioned that there was a guy in Boston who was starting a, a public radio program called the Cultivated Gardener. Um, and they gave the name of the guy who was going to be producing it, um, George Holmesy. And so I looked up George Holmesy and because I live near Boston and I sent George uh, an email saying, I'd like to be part of this and here's what I'd like to do. And I proposed doing a weekly segment on the Cultivated Gardener called uh, In the Garden Center. And it was a two minute segment that tackled a certain topic um, you know, uh, that people needed to know about. And I had two minutes to make it uh, fun, engaging and give all the information and wrap it all up. <laughs> so, uh, and George said, yes. And, and the, the host, Michael Weishman said, yes. So for a year, I would go up to Boston and record those two uh, minute segments. I would go up and record a month worth of segments and they'll get plugged into that public radio show. And after, I can't remember how long we were on the air, maybe two years, uh, but at that point, the show folded for funding reasons. Um, and uh, at that point, I decided, you know, I really love radio. I've always loved listening to radio. I'm, I, I listen to audio books. I, I love that way of taking in information. And so I then started approaching um, my local stations and I ended up going to a local talk radio station with a proposal that they said yes to. And now I have for, I think almost 25 years, I think it's close to my 25th anniversary. Um, I have hosted this, or maybe it's 20th. Anyway, um, I have hosted Garden Line, which is a call-in show, it's live call-in. I never know what is gonna come in on the air. I never know. All I know is when my board operator puts up a name in the town, somebody is calling from, I have no idea in advance what they're going to ask, right? So it's kind of fun that way. Um, it's a challenge, certainly. And uh, mainly how I prepare for the show every week is I have certain regular segments. I start out with a plant that I love and talk about that. I start out the second hour with a, a rant or a rave about a garden practice or product. In the winter time, I have a guest for a half an hour, uh, but during the growing season, I just take calls. And I usually have in mind a few things that I know are happening in the area or with plants and gardening or something that's you know caught my eye as a plant lover. And in between calls, I will talk about that. And otherwise, people ask me questions, and you know, most of the time I know the answer, and occasionally I don't. But on the times that I don't know the answer, uh, I'm happy to say, you know what? I have no idea, but I'm going to look into that, and and I'll report back. So, so it's it's fun that way. It's it's um, my listeners are the most gracious people on earth because I often give them an answer that they don't want to hear. Like, no, you can't make that 20 foot tall tree be 10 feet tall again, um, you know? Uh, and so sometimes I'm telling them an answer that they really don't want to hear and yet they're gracious anyway. So, so that's, that's, it's a nice thing, it is. You also run a popular podcast, Plant Rama with co-host Ellen Satros. Aside from the format, how does Plant Rama differ from your radio show? How do you encourage your audience to listen to both your podcast and radio show? Yeah, well, uh, Plant Rama was actually um, designed to, first of all, appeal to a national audience. My radio show, although I have listeners over most of from the Midwest through the East Coast, not so much on the West Coast because it 
goes on the air at 5 a.m. there. But um, uh, Plant Rama was really designed to be a national program, number one. Number two, the name itself says that it was um, conceived to be a program about plants, not just about gardens and gardening. And that was deliberate for several reasons. First of all, because uh, my co-host Ellen Zakos and I saw that many people today, they are gardening, they are growing plants, they don't consider themselves gardeners. And so we wanted a name that brought those people in. We wanted to bring in people who only grew house plants. There are many people who that is their experience with plants is, is uh, growing plants indoors in containers. Uh, and Ellen, uh, her background is very different than mine. Her, she for years was an urban gardener. She took care of terrace gardens on the top of buildings in Manhattan. Um, she helped wealthy people who had greenhouses on the top of those buildings to, you know, have uh, beautiful tropical plants in their greenhouse. And that's where she got her start, her interest in plants was with city gardening, house plants. And um, then she personally became very interested in foraging. And uh, so I don't want to go out in the field and work for my plant, look for my plants. I want to grow them in my garden, in my front yard or my backyard. Um, so, and I've never gardened on rooftop terraces. So we complemented each other very nicely with different experiences and we don't always agree. So, so that makes for a, a more lively podcast as well. And the podcast, we don't have uh, call-ins, we don't have guests. Um, it is, uh, the podcast is us doing, you know, certain regular segments and things that we are interested in and things that we know that maybe newer gardeners um, are interested in. And, and we have, I would say, uh, a larger population listening to us of new gardeners, um, as a result, and so, and that was, that was kind of our our goal uh, is to is to reach people and and to get them excited about everything from some obscure botanical term that they might want to know about to uh, a pasta recipe using what's in their vegetable garden. <laughs> what are your thoughts on social media? How has social media impacted the gardening community? Which platform has the greatest impact? Well, you know, when it comes to social media, whether it's gardening or anything else, you can really rave about how amazingly wonderful it is. And you can rant about how amazingly horrible it is. <laughs> and, and, and in gardening, it goes both ways. On the one hand, Having um, social media allows people to have a regional group where gardeners can uh, share information and, and that's great and pictures that are inspiring. And so since all gardening is regional, that is wonderful. It's no longer, you know, we aren't um, just limited to certain national gardening magazines uh, that you can, you know, be talking with people in your area about what's going on with plants and gardens right in your area. That's a wonderful thing. And um, it's a visual social media, it's a visual world out there and gardening is a visual subject. So that is a wonderful thing. It's horrible in that so much misinformation gets passed around. Um, recipes for, you know, Epsom salt concoctions and, um, you know, salt and vinegar to kill weeds. Don't do it, people, don't do it. Uh, you know, pictures that are um, put together as sort of instant eye candy and um, are bad information. Uh, Photoshopped, you know, rainbow roses, rainbow tomatoes, you know, um, <laughs> all of that kind of false information makes the rounds. And then there's the whole shaming aspect of social media and it extends to the plant world as well and it's uh, uh, 
a problem, you know, that uh, people should not be shamed for liking a particular plant or for not wanting to let a dandelion stay in their lawn. I, yeah, I understand, you know, dandelions may provide some support for bees. I, and I have dandelions in my lawn, don't get me wrong. But on the other hand, somebody who doesn't want dandelions in their lawn should be allowed to ask, how do I get rid of the dandelions in my lawn? <laughs> so, you know, so the same, the same pleasures and problems with social media uh, exist with gardening just like anything else. And, and uh, I just want to encourage everybody to, you know, be nice, stay polite, um, think three times before you press send. <laughs> so. I'm sure you know that millennials are obsessed with social media. What do you think we can do to engage millennials and get them interested in gardening? Well, I think, um, first of all, Instagram has done so much for getting millennials involved in gardening, number one. Um, number two, food. Uh, you know, food uh, was the original gateway drug to horticulture for millennials. It certainly was for my kids. Uh, I remember about, oh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, visiting my youngest son in California, and they had recently moved into a house. And I said to him, you know, Cy, that slope that you have there would be really beautiful planted with a selection of succulents. And he looked at me like I was out of my mind. And he said, mom, I have a very hard time planting anything that's not edible. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, growing safe food and tasty food and the awareness, uh, you know, millennials certainly have a much better awareness about the effect of um, people's diets on this planet than the baby boomers ever did. And that influences what they are interested in growing, which is great. And so that was, I think, the, the beginning gateway drug for them. The second gateway drug, of course, was houseplants. And I think we have Instagram to thank for that. Um, that um, suddenly, you know, bringing green indoors uh, became as hot uh, in, you know, the 21st century as it was in for the baby boomers in the late 60s. We had a house plant craze late 60s and early 70s. And, you know, ask any baby boomer about macrame houseplant hangers and they'll, oh yeah, you know. <laughs> so that was so and 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 in fact, you know, history does repeat itself because for the baby boomers it was the back to the land movement. Um, for many and the organic movement uh, for many that brought them to plants and gardens, and it's very similar um, today. So, and every generation discovers um, things new for themselves, which is a wonderful thing, and and claims it as their own, which is a fantastic thing. And so, um, just you know, sort of putting, I think it's up to all of us, no matter how old you are. And and you know, there's a, a garden communicator, Emma Biggs, who's like, I think she's 12 years old right now. Wow. And she's getting people hooked on plants and gardening. So go, go girl. Um, uh, I think it, it's up to the people who are excited about plants and to make it accessible always to the younger people and they will find a way to make it theirs and, and to run with it. And, and so any way that you know, I can support that, I certainly want to do. When you're not working or in the garden, what other hobbies do you have? What do you do to unwind? To unwind? Well, I love cooking, um, which is certainly related to gardening, but I do love to cook. Uh, what I do to unwind is Photoshop. Uh, you know, this goes back to my roots as an artist, right? And so making stuff, <laughs> that's, that's uh, and these days, uh, what you can do uh, with Illustrator and Photoshop is amazing. And so that's what I do to unwind. I will uh, in at night do something on Photoshop and create that way. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's probably the biggest, other than cooking, the biggest thing that I do for just for pure pleasure. Yeah, I use those skills in certainly my books and, and uh, 
and my, my work and my talks. Uh, I certainly use those graphic skills, but that's what I do just for the fun of it. And then I, 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 listen, I listen to other podcasts um, and, uh, you know, stream any number of movies and series and all of that. Do you use your Photoshop skills to create the graphics for all of your books and articles? Yes, yes. I, you know, I created the logo for Plant Rama, for example. Um, so I use I use those skills that way. Right now, I'm working on a new book proposal um, that is going to be illustrated with um, with a combination of sort of three dimensional collages that end up having some Photoshop work with them, and so it kind of brings brings uh, part of my work that I used to do as an artist. Uh, it's kind of using those skills uh, back for a garden book. So I'm, I'm almost in the ready, ready to uh, pitch that to a couple of publishers. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that that will land somewhere and, and continue to germinate. So final question. Where can yeah. everyone find you if they want to follow you and learn more? Oh, thank you. Well, my, my website is uh, gardenlady.com. All my social connections are there. I'm the garden lady on Instagram and uh, the garden lady on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so look for me there, LinkedIn. Um, but all of those connections are on my website. And, and the, there's a connection there, of course, to Plant Rama as well. Uh, Plant Rama can be found at plantrama.com. That's the podcast website. And on my uh, Garden Lady website, there is a link to stream my radio show, uh, on, which is on iHeartMedia, and the link to the recordings of that radio show, which are podcast on iHeartMedia. So yeah, and I hope people stay in touch. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Those oh, were all my questions. Pleasure. It was a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you.